Hello everyone, this is Evan Abrams, and in this video, we're gonna be creating something called a finikistoscope. A little help from After Effects, a few expressions, and a little bit of math. This is a kind of proto-gif, or I guess maybe an ancient meme. Uh, the first ones we start to see at the start of like the 1800s, as people were drawing these little images around the outside of a disc and giving it a spin and things seem to animate. You imagine they had to draw these things with their hands on papers. However, due to the power of technology, After Effects, all these great computers, so we can create these kinds of physical optical illusions a lot easier these days. This is a little bit of a deeper dive than we usually do, so there are chapter markers in the description. If you're ready to get crafty, then stick around. And since that's a very tired, ancient pun, you know it's time to start the tutorial. Much of the footage you'll see me working with here has been lovingly provided by our sponsor, Yellow Images. Yellow Images is the number one marketplace of high quality premium mockups, creative fonts, and my personal favorite, 360 degree images. They also have a creative store full of amazing graphical assets like lettering, icons, illustrations, patterns, textures, presets, brushes, and much, much more. Now they're most known for their mock-up templates. If you're doing branding or product work, you can quickly and professionally show clients how your designs will translate into real world contexts. I really enjoy their Images 360 product. A big frustration with regular stock assets is not having an angle quite right for a certain project, but when things are captured from multiple angles and elevations, sometimes up to 144 images of a single object, those pain points are not a problem anymore. Yellow Images are hooking us up with a discount for anything you might want on their site. The first 100 people to use the coupon code ECABRAMS20 will get 20% off when they use the link in the description and pick up some excellent assets from Yellow Images. So a finikistoscope, it's a kind of old time GIF or an ancient meme. It dates back to 1832 and was a disc with images around it that you spin and the movement of the disc plays the animation. It's kind of an optical illusion. The finikistoscope took off as a kind of novelty toy and along with later technologies like the zoetrope flipbook, <laughs> Zoopraxisoscope paved the way for film animation and eventually where we're at right now. And while the Fenikistoscope isn't in high use today, it did have a bit of a resurgence on another rotating media, the vinyl record. And while this might feel like a bit of a holdover from groovier times, musicians like Bonobo, Kate Bush, and Alan Madsen have been using this technique to great effect even today. This intersection of art and science can make some really fun results, but can take some fiddly work. So how does a disc of pictures turn into animation? Our brains are constantly trying to make consistent patterns out of what we see. It's easier for us to think of these images as one continuous movement than as many moving pictures. So that's how we get the illusion of animation. Now, at a certain point, there are not enough frames to complete the illusion, or it's not spinning fast enough and the illusion breaks. For most people, that threshold is between 10 to 12 frames per second. So we need at least 12 frames around the circle, and then we just spin it at one revolution per second, right? Well. Kind of. There's some math that goes into this stuff, and getting this to move at the right speed you want can take some fiddling. But we can see by some historical and contemporary examples, there is a lot of variety in how these things can be put together. We can start by simplifying the process and locking down some variables. In this video, we're going to assume a rotation speed of 45 revolutions per minute, which is 0.75 revolutions per second, or 270 degrees per second. So if I want to have a 30 frames per second animation, uh, very smooth, that means I need one frame every nine degrees. And the total duration of the animation then, for all the way around the disc, would be 40 frames. But all that can be a lot of math, but that's why we have computers, right? So we can let them do all the math and we can be more creative. So that's where After Effects comes in. Our goal in After Effects is to take an animation and display its frames around a circle, offsetting each frame by a number of degrees. This process starts with building a large comp that we're gonna call the plate. It's a whole frame long and really quite big. It's like a massive circle. Let's go with maybe 2000 by 2000 pixels. This plate will be filled with copies of our animation comp, the thing that will hold whatever excellent animation we're gonna be using. This animation holder comp that we've just called animation will be longer and thinner maybe than you're used to seeing. And that's because it has to run from the middle of the circle to the outside of the circle. Here's a lovely little example animation. We've got this one set to be a 40 frame loop of this spinning spaceman. He's made of an image sequence from Yellow Images, and we're using time remapping to have him spin thrice around. But we'll talk more about designing animations after we've got our system locked down. 
For now, we just need to see something in here. And he's down here at the edge because he'll be along the outside of the circle. So back into the plate, how do we get this 40 frame animation to array around the outside of the circle? Oh, it's expressions. Specifically, we're gonna put one on the rotation, then we're gonna put one on the time remapping. Here's the one on the rotation. Variable i at the top is looking at the index value of the layer and subtracting one from it. That means that variable i is gonna be zero for layer one, and then on layer two, it's gonna be one, then on layer three, it's gonna be two, and so on like that. At the end, we're gonna multiply that i value by the number of degrees between each layer. And that's going to be 360 degrees divided by the duration in frames of that animation comp. We can find the number of frames in that comp by dividing the duration of that animation comp in seconds by the duration of the frame of that comp in seconds. And that's what's happening here on the second line, this variable f that we've set up. And this final little bit at the end, multiplying by negative one, will cause things to array anti-clockwise around. You can leave that out if you want slash need it to array clockwise around. Just remember that we're going to put this on a record player and record players tend to rotate clockwise. So if you want your animation to play forward, uh, then we need to array our frames anti-clockwise. Then we move the anchor point and start duplicating this thing all the way around. Classic stuff. Let's undo those duplicates and get offsetting them in time now. After we turn the freeze frame on for the layer here with layer time freeze frame, then we can set an expression on the time remapping property. This starts with the same base, creating that i variable that will then be zero and then one and then two and so on. Then we just multiply that by that frame duration in seconds of the animation comp. Because the time remap property is expressed in seconds and the frame duration is also expressed in seconds, this will always return to us the next frame in that comp, regardless of the frame rate of that comp. So now we can duplicate the animation comp, and each copy will be offset in rotation and offset by one frame compared to its neighbors. Now we can load in pretty much any animation into that animation comp, set the frame duration, and everything will update. See what happens when we change this to be 16 frames long. See how it updates? Then we just have to shut off the excess copies or duplicate more as needed. With this framework in place, this core of the piece, we can focus on creating interesting animations. Let's begin with a simple loop. This may be old news for many viewers, but loops are a good choice for this kind of thing, so it feels irresponsible not to cover how to make them. In a loop, we want the end of the animation to flow into the start. It's a common mistake to make the first and last frames exactly the same frame, but that would make two of the same image right next to each other around the circle in this loop. In this very simple example of an eclipse-like movement, we can see one circle moving over the other. If both the first and last frames were this full circle, that's not quite right. So we push that last keyframe, one frame, boop, off the end. Then the end, the final frame, flows into the first frame rather than being duplicates. Now, here's another example using an image sequence. As with any footage, we can time remap it, going layer, time, enable time remapping, and then you can see the frames that make up this footage represented here in this property. So if we want this to loop over the length of our piece, we wanna make sure that the last frame, frame 16, happens on the last frame, the end of this animation. And see that this keyframe is the last frame because this is the frame just before we want to come back to frame number zero. It's a little bit different, but is accomplishing the same thing visually. So when we watch this back, this makes a simple loop. If you're interested in more looping techniques, let me know in the comments and we can get into more advanced looping solutions in other videos. Next up is spirals. Loops are nice, but how about a nice, trippy, spooky spiral? This takes that looping concept and takes us one step further. And it starts with creating the, the travel of the object. If you can imagine a spiral being drawn by the movement of something moving outwards or inwards, well, the angle, the vector that that's on is gonna be changing over time. So first, here is that moving element. This is a skull that appears to be rotating because it's an image sequence and we've time remapped that and then looped the time remap property using the basic loop out expression. And then that skull is translating down the frame here and it's really taken its time, much longer than the 40 frame loop it's meant to become. And that's fine because this is just a building block that we need to remix. We're also scaling it up as it goes so that skulls will be smaller in the middle of the spiral than they are on the outside. 
Now for the tricky part. We're going to take that travel, we're going to bring it into that animation space that's going to be replicated around, and then we duplicate it and offset it to make this thing. Starting this process from scratch would go like this. We plomp one down, we bring the playhead to the end, we command shift D to split off that last frame, extend that original frame so you don't have a little gap here at the end. Then we're going to drag that layer back to the start. Now, you can see that the start and end frames are the same, but as we know from looping, it should follow. So we bump this by one frame, and now it seems to follow. Repeat the process, split, extend, move, bump, and watch the magic as a stream of skulls just drifts on by. Repeat as needed for more. As you can see, we have two such lines of skulls offset from each other to make this denser spiral. Let your earlier setup deal with the arraying, and you've got this lovely spooky spiral. Now the last technique we're going to talk about is traveling. But it's less about what happens in the animation itself, and more about layering on multiple animations. In this illusion, you can see the middle space people, the astro folk, they seem to be spinning still. Whereas one row seems to rotate one way, and the other row seems to rotate the other way. I call this a travel. Uh, the phase of the animation is off so that they can seem to spin around. You know, the whole disc is spinning around, but these parts seem to spin in different speeds and directions. So this seemingly stationary ring has 40 frames around, but the others have more or fewer frames. That's what causes the illusion of this travel. Just remember, you'll need to combine multiple plates over each other. If you're making many plates with corresponding unique animations, be sure that the expressions inside those plates are referencing the correct animations. So plate one references animation one in the expression and is filled with instances of animation one. Plate two references animation two and so on. If you keep it organized, you're gonna be fine. But we need to get physical if we wanna pull off this party trick in person. To print this out, we want to move our disk comp ultimately into somewhere like Photoshop. This is as simple as going up here to the menus, selecting comp, save frame as, and then file. And then we're going to choose Photoshop down here in the render queue as the output module and best as the render settings. Then we open up the PSD and go to image mode and change that color mode to CMYK. That's the color space for print graphics as opposed to RGB mode for screen graphics. If you notice anything strange happen to the colors, you might need to adjust and tweak them here, or change the profile that you're going to be changing to. You may want to go into image size and adjust from 72 dots per inch to something nice and dense, like 300 or 400 dots per inch, so that things will print much cleaner. That means your massive 2000 pixel comp is actually only a few inches large when you print it out, but that's why we made it very large to begin with. This is also a good time to add in little cutting marks around the circle, or maybe a, a little hole in the middle. And then finally, just go up to print and print it out. I'm gonna recommend that you print on really hard cardstock, uh, a nice firm paper that can really absorb some ink, then you are ready to enjoy. Once you have this printed out, cut out, and it's rotating on the spindle of your choice, in this case we're using a record player set to 45 revolutions per minute, we can observe this effect. Now, if things look blurry, you likely need more light in the space. So having strong sunlight is going to help or just move the record player outside, I guess is weird. And if you're having a more indoor basement vibe, you can goose this effect with a little strobe light. Get yourself one of many free strobe light apps on your phone and set it to 30 hertz, which is 30 flashes per second, and the effect materializes. Filming strobe lights is very difficult on camera, so uh, sorry if this footage looks weird. And actually one of the easiest ways to see this thing uh, is what we've been doing this whole time, which is uh, having a look at this through a camera. Because of how cameras work, if you set your recording device to 30 frames per second, uh, then you'll see the effect on your screen much clearer than you may with your own eyes. So if you're having trouble seeing your fenakistoscope really fen out, then give those methods a try. If you have any questions about any of the stuff we talked about here, please get at me in the comments. I try to answer them all when I'm able, try to get you through this stuff. I hope you've enjoyed talking about this weird little bit of motion design, this little bit of animation history right here. If you like what we do on this channel, then please subscribe. We've got lots of great plans for some interesting content coming up. I think you're going to love it. We usually talk a lot more about uh, After Effects and technology things, so this is a little bit of a departure, but I hope a welcome one. If you end up making something cool with this stuff, and I know you will, I would love to see it. Please tweet it at me or tag me on Instagram. I'm at ECA on those places. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for 